morning, there will be great blessing for us all as we turn to God's words. Uh, please turn with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter 3, second in uh, the series that we've begun in this wonderful and really foundational book, uh, really for understanding so much about Christianity. It's not only foundational for the Old Testament, but it shapes so much of what we see revealed in the Lord Jesus when we come to the New Testament, and hopefully we'll get a bit of a taste of that this evening as well. We're on page 46. Uh, we're going to read the whole chapter, and as we're now probably mostly there, why don't I just add another prayer to that we've sung to ask for God's help. Let's pray together. Lord, we've been thinking all of our service so far about your steadfast love. We thank you for the fact that you are the God who reveals yourself to us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one true God whose nature is always to have mercy. Have mercy, therefore, now, gracious Lord. Send your Spirit that he might shed light upon us. Give us a taste and a hunger and a, and a burning heart for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And would we truly know you better as a result of what we read and think about now together? We pray that we would have a knowledge that transforms us, that we might live more as your children and that we might serve you as we wait for the return of Jesus. Do all of this now, we pray, Lord, for the sake of Christ and by your might. Amen. So Exodus chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come. Come. I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain." Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now please let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go, unless compelled by a mighty hand. 
So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. Well, this is the Lord's word to us this evening. Please keep it open as, uh, as you hold it there. It'll be helpful for you, not least in such a big chunk, just to track with what I'm saying. Make sure that uh, as we hope and pray every week, we only say that which is right there in the text. And if it would help you to follow along on the back of the notice sheet, there's a little outline. Uh, the points will appear behind me on the screen as well. A little bit of, uh, well, it's not quite audience participation to begin with, but uh, see if you can clock the, the quote and where it comes from. It's pretty famous. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Now, one of the great fun things of preaching is that I can see the genuine knowledge some of you have and the sort of slightly uncomfortable, I think I know that, but at least I don't have to claim that I do. It's from Romeo and Juliet, a famous speech that Shakespeare wrote, basically saying that the name of someone really shouldn't matter. But it does, of course, in Romeo and Juliet. It wouldn't change the love that they have one for another if they were called something else. And yet, the name sticks, as you'll know if you know the story. And as you'll have gathered from our reading tonight, we are thinking about the name of God. This is one of the most important chapters in one of this most important of books, because God says himself there, doesn't he, that this is the name by which I am to be remembered forever. And if we get to grapple with the name of the God who made all things, then actually we are getting to know him better. For in the Old Testament, names of people really mean something. They tell you a story about them. I had a fun little while trying to figure out who in our church family, whose name would be furthest from the reality of their own life. I won't give you all of the sort of short list that I had, although if you want to, you can come and talk to me later. I, I hoped that mine might have made the top of my own list. So Hamish is Gallic for James, which is Greek for Jacob, which means deceiver, which is slightly unfortunate or smooth one, which is equally unfortunate because I'm more of an Esau in terms of hairiness. Uh, the, the answer that I landed on, though, she's going to hate me for this, is Di. Uh, Di's name, she looks very unhappy. Di's name is from Diana, who you may well know was uh, the pagan goddess of hunting, the moon, and other things. And it's basically a compliment to say Di is very far from a pagan goddess. Di is a wonderful, godly lady. So our names don't really tell us anything about us. But, as we've said, the names within the Old Testament do. They, they tell us who we're dealing with. And if you were with us last week, you'll remember, I hope, that the great goal of Exodus is that we might know who God is. It was written so that the Israelites, who he has saved, would know who he was, so that as they went into the land with loads of other gods around them, they would not only know him intellectually, but would live for him that they would know that he was the one God and that they would love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it was written, and God displays himself so that those who aren't his people might know that he is God. When we get into the next few chapters and we see the program the Lord lays out of the Israelites going before Pharaoh, this refrain will come, that they might know, that you might know, that they might know. So that is our goal tonight under God. That together, all of us, whether we're here as Christian people or whether you're joining us as someone who's, who's just figuring out what you think about Christianity, the goal is that we might know God better so that we might love and serve him with all that we are. So we're going to begin the, the two movements of the chapter. We'll form our first two points. And then we're going to, in our third point, as we come to a close, think about how the wider scriptural storyline picks up this seismic moment, specifically in the person of Jesus himself. So cast your eyes back down with me to the beginning of chapter three, and we can just locate ourselves with where we're at. We've been told at the end of chapter two that God has heard and seen the horrible genocidal suffering of his people in Egypt. And the writer tells us in verse 23 that uh, this happened in the many days when Moses had fled Egypt and was out in the wilderness. And in Acts chapter 7, uh, Stephen, when he gives us his Bible overview, tells us that those many days are in fact 40 years. 
So imagine that, 40 years of Moses being away from his people, 40 years from when Israel first rejected him as the redeemer God was raising up, 40 years of tending another man's sheep. It's intriguing to wonder what those years entailed, but we do know that God is a God who does not do waste. We can't access Moses' heart and mind in those wilderness wanderings himself, prefiguring another 40-year period that would come. But we do know, we can trust, that all of it has been leading up to this point, when he would meet with his God and he would be called to shepherd God's own flock, not that of another man. And the reason I just dwell on that at the beginning is because I want you to notice that as we hit verse 1, the pace of the narrative that we've got slows right down. You know, we've had 40 years disposed of just in a couple of verses. And now we go into almost real time. And any time you're reading your Bible in any of the narrative sections, when the author slows right down, it's a sure sign that here is where we are to pay attention. Here's where we are to listen closely. And as we meet Moses, he's come to Horeb, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him. This messenger of God, who throughout the Old Testament is identified so closely with God himself that it's kind of hard to figure out where one ends and the other begins. There's a deliberate ambiguity there, for here is one speaking for God, and yet the very presence of God is being conveyed, is being communicated. And the angel says, God says through the angel... Moses, come here. He calls to him, and Moses approaches. The God who we've been told in Genesis has spoken all things into being is now directly addressing this wilderness shepherd. He's the God of Moses' father, he tells him. He is the God who Moses therefore knows in some fashion. And the writer presses upon us that this is the God who is holy. You'll have noticed maybe the ways in which we are told that. Moses says, verse 3, I'll turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. We'll come back to that famous detail. But God begins by saying, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Now, on one level, this is, this is normal ground. It's perfectly possible that Moses had been there before with his flock. Maybe the grazing was good there. We don't really know. And yet the presence of God, old-fashioned word coming up, hallows that ground. The presence of God takes the normal ground and renders it special, set aside, apart. That's what uh, the root of holiness really means. Something or someone in this case that is distinct, that is different, who is above and apart. Here is the God who is holy. He's the one who's worthy of respect and of awe, of fear even. You notice how Moses uh, covers his face and bows down. And it's more than just a, a separateness. It's more than just someone standing from afar off. It is a marker of purity. Just look down with me again, and you can see it in God saying, do not come near. Throughout the Old Testament, the unholy cannot approach the holy. If you're familiar at all with the book of Leviticus, and if you're not, have a, have a read through it, you will see the, the necessity of lots of sacrifices so that those who are unholy could progressively come into the presence of a holy, morally separate God. That's where the fire really matters. Because here, the creator of the world is signifying his presence apart from his creature, Moses. And he is one who is like a blazing fire, we're told throughout the scriptures, a fire that will never burn out. I remember when I was younger, genuinely thinking that the point here was that in some way this was a special bush because the bush itself is somehow flame retardant. You know, it's not, it's not being consumed. Whereas rather, I think the emphasis is clearly on the fire that is not consumed. Moses himself draws our attention to that by saying, look, I'm going to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned? Here is an unquenchable fire that can never go out and signifies the presence of this eternal God. 
And just as he demands the distance of anything sinful, well, so therefore we see that ourselves as readers. Whether you are an Israelite child sitting around the, the campfire on your way to the promised land being told this story, whether you were somewhere in exile after the people of Israel had been banished from the land for their own sinful idolatry, whether it's us here today in 21st century St. Andrews, here we see the holy, separate, distinct God who is seated far above all things, coming down and revealing himself to his people. One of the questions that will come up very sharply for Israel once they have exited Egypt is how on earth can we who are unholy have this holy God living in our midst? It really is a question that will not be answered until the coming of Jesus Christ in fullness. So one of the things we'll be thinking of in our morning series in Hebrews. But the beginning of the answer is that it is God who will reveal himself on his terms to his people, and they are to listen and to respond. And even here, before we dive into the details of his name, I want to suggest that there is good news for us. Good news for us, wherever we are on the, the spectrum of faith in Jesus Christ. You see, this God, who is so different to us, is not playing hide-and-seek. He's not a God who is somehow saying to Moses or the people, look, you've got to creep your way towards me under your own steam. He takes the initiative. He hears. He sees. He remembers. He comes down, and he reveals all Moses at this point has to do is listen with obedient faith. Take God at his word and go. It's what Israel are to do. That is what people are called on by God to do all through Scripture. God speaks to us in the created world. He speaks directly to Moses. He speaks through his word. And as we were thinking about this morning, he has spoken through the gifts of Jesus Christ, his son. It's good news that we can hear the God, the voice that spoke all things into being. But it is weighty news. I think sometimes we can fall into the, the trap, even as Christians, of treating God's own self-revelation almost as, as disposable communication. Think how many of us uh, will just file our emails as disposable because we won't pay attention. You could talk to Stephen as the church secretary about that, the, the various pleadings, guilty by the way, for not having done various things with El Vanto. Uh, you could think about the WhatsApps that you get, that group where you've muted the chat and there's like 500 notifications with cats in a GIF. Think about the conversation with a friend where you're half listening and before you know it, you've forgotten what they're saying and you're weighing up whether you can even respond. Certainly for myself, as I've just been Mulling, meditating in Exodus 3, I'm struck again by the sheer weight of the glory of God as he speaks. Moses listens and he falls on his face. It'd be wonderful if our own listening of God was characterized by that, that right reverence, that response to the blazing purity of the God who reveals himself. That encounter with God leads, I would say, to what seems like Moses' pretty seemingly reasonable self-doubt in verse 11. See, that, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? It's a staggering meeting with God who states his faithfulness, and Moses isn't sure what to do. And God doesn't really give him a sort of, you know, answer that you'd have at the front of a lecture hall. He simply says, no, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to bring you to myself. That's the sign. The sign that I'm with you is when I've done it. So he doesn't pander to Moses' question, but he just restates that he's going to be with him. But you can see that Moses still isn't quite happy because verse 13 is the answer to Moses' question of who on earth are you? Who should I say to the people of Israel that has sent me? And that's the bulk of our second point, the glorious answer that God is the true God who is eternal, who is faithful, and who is mighty to save. A few things that you might have noticed within these verses, this answer from God. Reams and reams of paper has been printed. Lots of, of excellent essays and lots of slightly average ones have been written about what is meant by the name of God here, the, the I am who I am. 
But I want to focus as we begin on uh, how eternal God is. Eternality is one of those things that's very hard for us to wrap our heads around, isn't it? He's the one who eternally is himself, but we can't fully grapple with that because we are so bound in time. Every newspaper article, if you think of it as you read it, has with with varying degrees of randomness the age of the people involved in the article printed. If you've ever noticed that, it sometimes bothers me. Why do I need to know that Reginald Maplestoft is 54 and comes from Milton Keynes in an article about economic policy? Who knows? But I think partly it's because we like anchors in time. We like to know where we're placed. We all operate with a kind of mental timeline that we're stuck to because that is who we are. We're finite creatures. And yet God says, I am who I am. There is no timeline for God. Uh, You'll see that your footnote in, in this edition tells you that actually that phrase, I am who I am, can bear the weight of of almost different tenses. Not only I am what I am, but I will be what I will be. He is a God who alone in creation has the luxury of being totally self-defining. He is simply who he is all the time. And that is so different to us, so other But it's so different also to the other gods of the time. Uh, We thought last week about the conflict that was going to be happening throughout, as we see with Pharaoh oppressing Israel. Well, God is going to come and not only wrest Israel from Pharaoh, he's going to wrest Israel publicly from the domain of all these other gods, gods that are bound to the things of this earth, the gods of the Nile and the gods of the sun and of the crops and of fertility and of the moon, gods with the heads of animals, God's with the characteristics of animals. And you project that on through. The gods of the world are oh so human and oh so bound to the stuff of this earth. Yet here is the God who alone is eternally himself. And that is really excellent for Israel to know. Because to be bound in time is to be buffeted by time. It's occasionally to be broken by time. Think yourself of the various wounds you've received just in whatever span you've lived thus far. Those who die because their time has come, as it were. Or we whose promises can be so time-bound and oh so quickly time runs out on what we thought was a real intention how time changes. You might be on the cusp of 2024 excited, but you might also be dreading the roller coaster ahead because the last six months has been different. There's that wonderful hymn where there's a line where it says, change and decay in all around I see. We see fickle nations. We feel our own fragile hearts. We battle with failing bodies. And many succumb to to fatal challenges. Yet here is God. I am who I am. Yesterday, today, forever. Always and only himself. That is who he is 100% of the time. You could make a list of the various attributes of God in Scripture. And he is all of those always. What a wonderful God to know. What a wonderful God to have as your God, as my God, for Israel to say, he is ours and we are his. Let's serve him. He's the eternal God. And one of the attributes, it's what we've been thinking about all evening, is that he is eternally faithful. If I were to ask you to uh, go back over this chapter and and grab a trusty sort of colored pen or or pencil in hand and underline the repeated phrases that you find, one of the most repeated ones will be the sort of genealogy of God's faithfulness. We first see it, uh, it, we saw it at the end of uh, chapter 2, actually, verse 24. God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. We see it again as God answers Moses' direct question. Who are you? Well, I am who I am. 
Say this, verse 14, to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, which is just a rendering of I am who I am, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Again, verse 16, this is what you are to say to the elders of Israel. So you, Moses, this is who I am. You, Moses, say this to the people about who I am. And you, Moses, say this to the leaders of the people about who I am. This is the God who was with and who bound himself in solemn promises, in covenant, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. You could look back to the foundation stone of that promise in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3 in your own time, where God meets Abraham and he calls him, And he promises that he is going to make Abraham's people a great nation. That he's going to give them a great place, this promised land. That he is going to bless them because he will be their God and be with them forever. And that that blessing will be so bountiful, so overflowing that it will run out to all of the other nations. That is the the story told simply by name-checking those three men. This is who God is, the one who is faithful. And that is a key thing for Israel to grasp. That this is the God who has made and will keep forever promises. It's so unlike Israel, sadly. The Old Testament will tell that sad story over and over. God is faithful when they are not. Any of the gods of Egypt, or if you're familiar with Greek or Roman mythology, any of those pagan gods were massively capricious, massively changeable. God is not like them. Think of what stands in for the, the idols of our day. Just tell me, or rather think, whether any of these things you would add the word faithful to, trustworthy, eternally stable, and rock solid. Money? Faithful, beauty, eternal, success, rock solid, romance, even good things like many of these are, or or family or relationships, none of them can bear the weight that we might place on them. All of them are susceptible to decay, to theft, moth and rust destroy it. Thieves can steal them. Yet God is eternally faithful. Do you not feel tonight, and I have no means of looking into your heart, do you not feel something of the pull, the the beauty, the weight of that perfect faithfulness? This is who God is. We're to know him. We're to worship him. And this eternally faithful God, that eternal faithfulness expresses itself here in one very particular way, because he is the God who is mighty to save. That's framed this whole meeting between God and Moses. God has remembered and seen and heard, and now he acts. He says to Moses exactly that, verse 7, I have heard their cry, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them. It's what he expands on in verses 16 to 20. He lays out the program of what's going to happen for the next 10 or so chapters of this book. But all of it is God's saving might. I love even the the, the motion of it. Do you see that in verse 8? God has come down to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land. Is the God who stoops to save but he does it in might. He's going to stretch out his hand, a mighty hand, verse 19, to destroy those who would set themselves against God and his people so that he might draw his people to him in love and in faithful salvation. So this name of God, Yahweh, I am who I am, I want to suggest becomes a shorthand, not only here but throughout Scripture, for all of God's dealing of grace with his people. As they hear it, as they read it, as they sing it, as they're taught it, this is who they are meant to think of. Not just random knowledge. Not just, oh great, we know God's name. But we know God. 
holy, eternal, faithful, deliverer. He is ours. That's who we're to serve. When we're in the land and we're being drawn away to other gods, that is our God. When we're laboring under rubbish kings, that is our God. Think of us today when we have other competitors for our hearts, for our time, for our money, for our gifts. That is our God. We'll all have been there at some point, and if we haven't, you will be at some point when the the fire of love in our hearts, unlike the fire of God, is burning low. When it feels like the embers are struggling, flickering, you may have seen a fire as you've tended it, and you're thinking, can I get it back? Well, one really practical thing we can do, and I take it this is what it was designed for in many ways for Israel and for us, is to meditate again on the name of God, the name that carries the story of his character and his salvation, that we might love him. And as we move to a close, it would be remiss of me not to show us how this focuses in on the person of Jesus. Because friends, in many ways, we are in a more privileged position tonight than Moses was with his sandals off in front of the angel of the Lord. Because we know how this story found its fulfillment. So our third point, the God who has come down. I love that, that detail, as already said, that God says, I have come down. I mean, Moses was blessed beyond any mortal man. We're told in chapter 33 of Exodus, verse 11, that God spoke with him face to face as a friend. Moses writing that, I mean, he knew his own privilege. He could hear and meet with God. Yet if you reflect on that language of coming down, and some of you may know the cry of the prophet Isaiah, rend the heavens and come down to deliver us. The scriptures are very clear that that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The son of God who walked that ark of redemption John's gospel tells us he came down from above in eternal riches with the Father to deliver us, to save us, that we might be brought to God. Here is the great I am in human flesh. I've put on your uh, notice sheet there on the outline the the line Jesus himself speaks in John chapter 8, verses 56 to 59. The the Jews, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders say to him, you're not 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. It's grammatically really weird, wrong, for a reason. Because he's saying, I am the shining forth, the embodiment, the the billboard, the living display of the God of that bush. The great, invisible, glorious I am. Some say that Jesus didn't claim divinity. But look at what the religious leaders did. They picked up stones to throw at him, not in a game, but to kill him, because they understood that he was claiming to be God himself. It's a wonderful thought. If ever we're in doubt about the character of God, the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, the salvation of God, we can reflect on who Jesus is. This audacious, amazing, world-changing claim that this God is with us and for us. So you might be someone listening tonight who needs to remember that God is eternal because you feel so changeable. You may need to remember that God is holy because you don't view holiness yourself as as a beautiful thing but an oppressive thing. You might need to remember that God speaks because you feel rudderless in a confusing world. You may need to remember that God is faithful because either you are breaking others or are being broken by faithlessness. And you may need to remember that God is the savior, that even your sins can be forgiven and washed away. Whoever you are, look to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is I am, the one who reveals God to us, who brings us to God. It's a wonderful offer that we can have that in Christ. And one of the the great characters in Lord of the Rings, Treebeard, 
says to Pippin and Mary that real names tell the story of the things they belong to. So my name, Di's name, doesn't tell you any story about us. But the name of the Lord, Yahweh, I am who I am, tells the story of salvation, which if you trust in Jesus, you have your place in as well. So as we reflect, as we pray now, let's pray that that story would keep being narrated to our hearts, that even as we sing, we would know God and love him. Let me pray, and after that, the band are going to lead us as we sing. Gracious God, eternal, holy, faithful, and saving, we praise you for your kindness. We praise you for who you are. We praise you for your name, your holy name. And we thank you that we are not left in the dark, but that in Jesus we know you as our Father, that by your Spirit we worship him as your Son, our Lord, and that we can keep in step with your Spirit within us. We pray now that truly as we gaze upon Jesus, as we ask that he would be our vision, we pray that we would have again narrated to us the the story of that true exodus from sin and death and hell that he has worked. And as we await his return, keep us going in love and in obedience and in faithful worship of you, that we might know you truly, just as you know us. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to close by singing, Be 